Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I can see participants uh, joining in right now. I'm just going to give them a couple of more minutes before that we start. Okay. okay, hi again. I see more people joining. So let's just give it a couple of minutes. Okay, I think we can start. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, thank you for attending this webinar and the series of webinars that we are hosting. This is the third one. So uh, we are very happy today to be uh, talking with uh, Dr. Emir Bakker. Uh, he is a um, so basically, he teaches several subjects at Ukraine University in the School of Medicine, primary biochemistry and genetics. Uh, his research background is in molecular oncology and computational biology, and he supervises research students at both the undergraduate and the postgraduate level. Uh, his research team is currently focusing on computational modeling of molecular cancer uh, signaling pathway. So today he's going to be telling us a little bit more about how the course les sample lessons at Tukran University, how, that, uh, how it usually goes. And he's going to talk a little bit briefly about the medical degree at uh, the university itself. And then later on, we will have the chance to just um, hear a little bit more about uh, the process of application and what are the basic requirements. Um, also, uh, the chat section is open for everyone who has a question. So if you have anything, just write it down and we'll attend to it later on. Um, thank you again for joining. And um, Dr. Emir, I'm going to leave the floor for you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the introduction, Reem. So yeah, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Amir Baka, and I'm a senior lecturer in the school. In the context of the MBBS program, you'll see me for, you'll see me for some biochem, some genetics, and I also teach evidence-based medicine within the school. So my goal as an educator in the school is to try and convince you and show you how little small molecular level changes can lead to pathology, okay? But today we're going to be focusing on a sample lesson and we're going to be looking at homeostasis and physiology. So do bear with me while I just share my screen. And this should be coming through to you now. Okay, so this session this afternoon is in two parts or this evening, depending on where you are. We're going to start with a sample lesson and we'll then talk about studying medicine in the UK. And we're going to begin with an introduction to medical language, actually, and physiology. So let's be honest, you can give me a show of hands or you can type in the chat. How many of you have ever opened a scientific textbook, read three sentences, not really taken anything in, and had to reread it to actually understand what it said. How many people has that happened to? It's happened to me, certainly. So for those of you that it's happened to, which I imagine is the majority because that's what science is like sometimes. Part of the reason of this is that medicine and science, they have their own language essentially, okay? So often when you're doing medicine, when you're doing science, you'll come across these large complicated looking words and you don't really know what they mean. But actually, if you figure out the meaning behind those words, they become significantly easier to understand. So let's fast forward about seven years, okay? You've finished your schooling, you've finished your medical degree, and now you're working as a junior doctor. Somebody comes running to you in the hospital and they say, help, we have a patient with tachycardia, glycosuria, and polycythemia. What do we do? So you've probably heard some of those words before. You might even know what they mean. But do you actually know where those meanings come from? So what we're going to do to begin is we're going to look at medical languages. And we'll start with these tables. So you can see on this table, or the first three tables, that we have the beginning and ending of words, prefixes and suffixes. 
And if you're able to break down what these meanings mean, it makes your life significantly easier. So let's look at a couple of words that you may have heard before. Cytosol. If you break this down and you look at the constituent parts, you can see, okay, we're referring first to cyto, which means related to cells or to a cell. And sol, you can see this is about a solution. So this means that a cytosol is the solution in a cell, okay? Similarly, you might have heard of the intercostal muscles before. So let's have a look at where that meaning comes from. So if we begin with inter over here, you can see it means between. And if you look for costal, then it will be somewhere on the table and it will mean between the ribs. There we go, just underneath it. So it's related to the ribs. So therefore your intercostal muscles are muscles between the ribs. Let's next look at glycosuria. So glyco, that's gonna be something that's related to glucose or sugar, glyc, gluco. And urea is something relating to the urine. So that means that glycosuria is glucose in the urine, okay? Next up, I'm gonna ask you guys to tell me the words for making new glucose, liver inflammation, and material in cells. If you want to type in the chat, then let me know when you've made those words. Just give you a couple of minutes to do this. So Nada has said hepatitis. So that's for your liver inflammation. Hepat or hepato, that's related to, to the liver. And itis is for inflammation. So well done. What about material in cells or making new glucose? So Nada says plasma cytosis uh, for material and cells. I like your thinking, but it's not quite right. Marwa says glucogenesis for making gl new glucose. Again, you're very close, but not quite right. Mariam, cytoplasm, perfect. So that's material in cells. So that's coming from cyto, so related to a cell or cells. And then we also have plasm which is material. So Marwa was very close when she said glucogenesis, okay? But there's something missing because the emphasis is on new glucose, okay? So how could you say making new glucose if I told you that glucogenesis is making glucose? Oh, Crystal, you're so, so close. You are so close. So it's not quite neo-glucogenesis because that then means new, making, um, new glucose making. So what it actually is, is gluconeogenesis. Okay, you're you were very, very close. But again, you've probably come across these scientific words before and you might know what they mean, but do you actually know why they mean what they mean? And when it comes to studying medicine or really any scientific degree, if you can get to grips with the nomenclature behind words, it makes your life infinitely easier, okay? And this applies to pretty much every branch of the medical sciences. So it applies to anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, biochem. So an example from biochem, I'm sure you've all heard of the wonderful process of glycolysis where you um, convert glucose to pyruvate. The first enzyme in that is something called hexokinase. 
and that converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. Again, break down that name, okay? So hexo is 6, hex is 6, so therefore it becomes glucose 6-phosphate. Kinase is something that adds a phosphate group, so therefore it's making it into 6-phosphate rather than a different modification. So for every single branch of medical science, if you can get to grips with why something means what it means and what the origins of these words are, it makes your life easier. So well done on, on creating those words, making new glucose, liver inflammation, etc. But now I'm giving you a challenge and I want you to think of a silly yet logically consistent word. So for mine, we have somebody running away. They're terrified. They don't want to be near it. And it's a red thing, okay? So they have erythrophobia. They are scared of red things. It's scientifically consistent, but it's silly. So that's your next challenge. In the chat, give me a word that is silly, but scientifically consistent, and let me know what it means. So Aya has said hydrophobic, someone who is scared of water. Whilst it might be, um, should we say, a bit more amusing in the context of a person, remember that hydrophobic and hydrophilic are genuine scientific terms used to describe things at a molecular level. What else can you think of, guys? Entomophobia, lipophilic. Oh, so who is it? Joey has said lipophilic a person that likes fatty food. So that very much applies to me. Although I do again, do you remember that lipophilic is a genuine scientific term as well? Hemophobic, dislike of blood. Apoptosis is cell death. Kleptomania is very true, but that again, that's a genuine word. What can you guys think of that's just silly? Aquaphilia, okay, loves the water. I'm gonna say I've got costal phobia, okay? I'm really scared of ribs, they terrify me. Or you could say trypophobia. Can you tell us what that means, Marwa? Fear of dots. <laughs> Excellent. And Jana has said uh, erythrophobia, which is the one we started with, which is a good point to now move on. So I just want you to appreciate the fact that you break down those words, life becomes easier. Okay. So understanding medical terminology is essential to both to understanding both medicine and physiology. We're going to talk now about homeostasis. And this is something that you've come across before in your studies. So homeostasis is the maintenance of a relatively constant internal environment, despite changes in the external environment. And your external environment can be things like the ambient conditions, the, present or absence, the presence or absence of food and drink, and the level of exercise that you undertake. And the parts of your internal environment that are maintained by homeostasis can be your core temperature, blood osmolarity, blood pH, and your blood glucose level. These are just some of the examples. 
And understanding permeostasis is going to be the most fundamental lesson that you'll have when you're training as a doctor. Okay. What we have on this slide are known as reference ranges or normal values. Okay. So these are the normal, healthy physiological ranges that exist for people. Because of course, you can't make a diagnosis and say that something is wrong without knowing how it should be in healthy people. Okay. So for your reference range, you can look at things like your arterial pH, the amount of bicarbonate in the blood, their urea concentration, their oxygen concentration, their glucose levels, and so on. Question for you guys. And again, yep, Hawida, this, this is a reference range. The question for you guys is, what affects these reference ranges? Because they're not the same for everyone. So have a think, what patient characteristics could affect what then reference ranges are? Genetics, so Joey says genetics. This can be true, but genetics is a very broad thing. So Dana says age, so does Zaina. And Adam, so age is one, age is one that affects your reference ranges. Gender, that's another good one. Men and women are, have different biological characteristics. But somebody pointed out diet, okay? Now diet is something that affects, and similar to malnutrition, this is something that affects what your values are but not what they should be, okay? So think of the difference. Me, 31 year old male, okay? If I choose to live a very healthy lifestyle, then my values will be within the healthy range. If I choose to live a very unhealthy lifestyle, you know, I go for a kebab every single night, I never exercise, etc. then that means that my values will change, but it doesn't change what they should be if I lived a healthy lifestyle, okay? So, so far we've had age, we've had gender, and now Haura has said race, so ethnicity, okay? That's a perfect example of something that can affect your reference range, as in what it should be if you're healthy. It's really nice thoughts, guys. Starting to think like doctors. Some of you are bringing in things that, again, that will change what your values are, but not what the values should be. So another serious question, and this is one that will decide whether you get into medical school or not, okay? It's very serious business. How many of you have ever fried an egg before? And you can just put me in the chat. Okay, congratulations, Adam, Mariam, Aya, you're all getting into medical school. So you don't need to worry about your schooling anymore. Okay. Now, this sounds like a bit of a strange analogy, but it's a very true one. Okay. What happens when you fry an egg? So you start off over here and you've got your water soluble egg, you've got the yolk and the clear solution around it. As you heat it up, okay, that water soluble state changes to become insoluble, okay? The clear liquid changes gradually to a thick white solution or a thick white solid state, okay? And that is irreversible. And it's exactly the same with the enzymes in your body, okay? So let's imagine that you, are, you have a patient who's going, undergoing excessive heat, for example, their proteins can degrade, they can denature, and they can form novel crosslinks. So changes in the conditions within your cell, such as the pH and the temperature, can cause irreversible damage to your cellular components, such as your proteins. And important proteins within the cells, such as your enzymes and receptors, can be affected by this, and that can threaten the life of your cell. If you threaten the life of the cell, you threaten the life of the tissue. If you threaten the life of the tissue, you threaten the life of the organ. You threaten the life of the organ, you threaten the life of the system, and ultimately the organism, okay? So again, molecular level details have significant clinical impact, okay? So if you 
are thinking about homeostasis and maintaining that internal environment, you can see why it's so crucial. So I just need to clear these drawings and we can move on to the next slide. So what happens during homeostasis? You begin with a normal homeostatic state, and then you have a change that causes a loss of homeostasis. You then make attempts to compensate for that change. If your compensation is adequate, then your health is maintained. If your compensation is inadequate, then it presents a health risk, okay? Now, if we were doing this in person, I would be very nasty and I would nominate somebody to run around the room for about two minutes until your heart's pounding, okay? Unfortunately, due to COVID and both human humanitarian ethics, I'm not allowed to do that right now. So instead, we'll talk about it hypothetically. So let's imagine that we have run around the room, okay? Your body needs to compensate. You have increased use of oxygen, increased production of carbon dioxide, increased production of lactic acid, increased production of heat. And if you don't compensate for those, then you could have too little oxygen available for essential aerobic reactions. The acidic conditions could affect your enzymes and the increased body temperature could also affect your enzymes. So therefore your body compensates. And to do that, it has an increased rate and depth of breathing. You have increased circulation of the blood, both heart rate and stroke volume, vasodilation in the skin and vasodilation in the muscles. So that's again, just highlighting that homeostasis is the fundamental aspect of diagnostic medicine, okay? And there are a number of different things that a doctor can do to measure homeostasis. So for example, they can take blood pressure and they'll consider, is the blood circulating at a high enough temp uh, pressure to each part of the body or is it too high, which can potentially damage your blood vessels? You can look at blood levels of ions, the number of blood cells, hormones, blood pH, blood gases, and we'll revisit that in a moment. You can also look at urinalysis. So what does the volume and urine composition tell you? You can tell a shocking amount of information about somebody by looking at their urine, but I would only ever do it in a professional context if I were you. You can also look at their core temperature. Is it right or do they have a fever? You can look at their ECG the echocardiogram. Now, thinking again about blood analysis, you can take things from arteries, veins, or capillaries. When you're looking just for the number of cells that somebody has, you know, how many white blood cells, how many red blood cells, which sampling site do you think they use? Venous, arterial, or capillary? Okay, so Hajar has said Venus. Why? You're right, but why? Okay, so you say it's the most visible, closer to the surface, and has a thinner wall. I like your thoughts, but it's not the main reason. What's one of the biggest differences between arterial blood and venous blood? Joey, perfect, lower blood pressure, okay? Perfect, guys, thank you. So that's one of the key differences. Arterial blood is much riskier to take from a patient because you have that higher pressure. So in fact, if you ever take an arterial blood sample, then you need to have a team on hand to know who know how to respond in case it goes wrong, because a patient can lose a lot more blood a lot more quickly if you take it if you make a mistake with arterial blood sampling versus venous. Good thoughts, good thoughts, guys. What about ABGs? So you might have heard of ABGs before. So those are arterial blood gases, and as the name implies, that's where you take it from arterial blood. Yeah, perfect, Haura, thank you. 
So you take it from arterial blood. Why do you take blood gas analysis from arterial blood, do you think? Why not take it from venous? It's oxygenated, Joey. So the arterial blood is what is reflective of what's actually delivered to your tissues. So therefore it's a more accurate reflection of what's going on with your patient. Excellent. We're gonna wrap up this sample lesson with a case study, okay? So we have um, a diabetic patient, okay? Who was brought to the emergency department. They were previously diagnosed with type one diabetes, okay? And they arrive in a semi-conscious state and you conduct a variety of tests. Before we go any further, they're diabetic, they're semi-conscious. What's your first thought of what might be wrong with them? Okay, so Hajar says low blood glucose. So dehydration, low blood sugar. So a couple of you are saying low blood sugar. So Haura asked to repeat the question. So the question was, you have the patient, they're diabetic, they're semi-conscious. What is your first thought of what might be wrong with them? So I know a couple of you have said low blood glucose, such as Khaldun and Hajar. Haura said diabetic ketoacidosis. I like that you're thinking of a formal diagnosis, but yeah, we're thinking a bit more simply hypoglycemia. So would you guys give the diabetic some, um, some sugar or some biscuits or something to help bring his blood sugar up? Is that what you do next? What would you do then, Hajar? Solution through IV, okay. But you're still, trying to, you're still trying to bring his blood glucose up. So Mariam says yes, because it's better to have, better than to have low blood sugar, fluid replacement, sugar dissolved in the solution. Okay, so you're all thinking that your patient has low blood sugar and you're gonna give him some, something to elevate his blood sugar. Let's see if you're right. First of all, when you to go to your patient and take measurements, you take his blood pressure and his blood pressure is high. Now, if you have hypoglycemia, so low blood sugar, isn't it a bit odd that you have high blood pressure? Shouldn't be the case. You next look at his, blood, his body temperature, and that's normal, okay? So nothing to worry about there. His urine volume is frequent, high volume, and it's dilute, okay? And this actually ties to one of the key symptoms of diabetes. So you might have heard before that one of the, the three main symptoms of diabetes are what's known as the three Ps, polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia. And this means excessive urination, excessive thirst and excessive appetite, okay? Those, yeah, perfect, Hara, three Ps. Those in conjunction with blood sugar are diagnostic for diabetes. So the fact that he's urinating frequently isn't that much of a surprise. What is a surprise, however, is that his blood glucose, his urine glucose, sorry, is high. And really you shouldn't see glucose in the urine. So he has glycosuria. And eventually when you look at his blood glucose, he has high blood glucose. Okay. So for those of you that said that you would just immediately give him an IV with, with sugar or a juice or a biscuit, you've killed your patient, I'm sorry. For those of you that wanted to pause and do a couple more tests first, congratulations, your patient is still alive. 
So let's have a look at what's going on here, okay? Our tests suggest that our patient is hyperglycemic. They have high blood sugar. And what's actually been happening is this patient has been omitting their insulin, okay? So they have excessive blood sugar because they've not been taking their insulin properly. So how can we tie that to the symptoms that we've observed? Let's begin with the high blood pressure. And again, I have a second very serious question that is going to determine whether you get into medical school or not. Who here has had syrup with pancakes before? And again, you can just type me in the chat. Okay, Adam, Marwa, everyone, perfect. You're all getting into med school. So one of the properties of, um, of that syrup is that it's sticky and it can be quite thick, okay? Now, I'm not saying that if a patient is hyperglycemic that their blood will taste like syrup. However, if you think about what's happening, you've got all of that sugar in the blood. It makes the blood stickier and a bit thicker and a bit harder for the body to pump around. Therefore, you've got the high blood pressure, okay? The glucose in the urine is because the body is trying desperately to get rid of the excess urine. So it's trying to flush it out from the blood through the urine. So that's why it's, we have glucose in the urine as well, okay? So this was just one small patient case study thinking about some very fundamental top level things. As you come onto a degree and you learn more about medicine and patient cases, you'll get more used to thinking laterally and thinking clinically. One of the challenges that you have if you want to become a doctor is you need to integrate several different levels of information, okay? Ranging from patient presentation, patient psychology, and through to their cellular level problems, okay? And the challenge is integrating all of that information together to come to the right diagnosis. But that is what we're gonna train you to do. So in part two now, we're going to talk about studying medicine in the UK. So in this presentation, this second half, we're going to be talking about why you should choose UCLan, um, partially because it's a supportive and global learning environment. We have an expert team, state-of-the-art facilities, and campus sites. We also have a variety of undergraduate programs. One thing you may come across is different nomenclatures for the degrees. Due to history, different universities in the UK will call their medical degree something different. So for some, it could be MBCHB. Others, it'll be MBBS, BMBS, BMBCH, for example. But the title doesn't matter. All of them are what's known as a primary medical qualification, okay? At UCLan, we call ours MBBS, so Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery but it doesn't matter what it's called. It'll just come from different universities. But in terms of the UCLan MBBS, some thoughts on why you might want to come here, other than what's hopefully been an enjoyable sample lesson, is that we have a global experience based in Lancashire. We're, top, we're ranked in the top 6.8% of universities worldwide, and our graduates are highly employable, okay? So 95.5% of our graduates enter employment or further study within six months of graduating. Uh, we were ranked first for money invested into student well-being, And we like to believe that we have a vibrant student community. And you are taught by world leading um, experts, innovators and expert clinicians as well. And we'll talk more about what that can mean for you as we move through the presentation. In addition to um, training doctors, we also train a variety of healthcare professionals, such as nurses, midwives, physician associates, dentists, and so on. And we actually we take advantage of that. And in your curriculum in MBBS, we have what's known as IPE events or interprofessional education events. So those are half days, for example, where you work with student nurses, student PAs, student social workers, and you're given a complex case. And together, using your different educational backgrounds, you address that problem and from many different angles. And what that gives you is insight into how the wider healthcare team can work together in practice. The UCLan MBBS is accredited by the General Medical Council, 
and our postgraduate programs have also received recognition from the Royal College of Surgeons. We've been training doctors and PAs since 2015. And one of our previous students has said that the support provided by the University of Central Lancashire, whether you're a fresher or a final year student, is phenomenal to say the least. Now, I mentioned earlier about the team that teaches you. So you're gonna be taught by a variety of people, okay? Some of them will be practicing clinicians. So medical doctors, nurses, et cetera, who are in clinical practice and can provide that real world context for you. We also have recently qualified clinicians who are teaching fellows. They might be junior doctors, for example. And what they provide is the essentially a role model for you because they're where you'll want to be in five years or so. You're also taught by expert scientists. So in your first two years in particular, you'll be taught by PhD scientists such as myself. And we all come from our own educational and research backgrounds. And that ties to that research act development. One of the differences between studying in school and studying in university is that often at university, you're taught by people who are doing research that's shaping the field, okay? So what you're being taught can often be very cutting edge and what's happening now. So a key example that I'll give you is I gave a cancer lecture in, to the year two MBBS students in November. In January, so just a month ago, a key paper was published in the field of oncology called the Hallmarks of Cancer. And that was the third update. And that's actually going to change how we teach cancer next year because we have to keep up to date with what the research is telling us, okay? That research active element as well is helpful for you because if you want to gain experience as a researcher, that's an option that's available to you. So you can work with research active staff to get experience, to get published, and to proceed down an academic medicine route if that's what you're interested in. We also have state-of-the-art facilities. I mentioned earlier on that we've been training doctors and PAs since 2015. So this means that our equipment's new and we're basing our education method off what research says is effective ways to train doctors. So we're a modern school of medicine we have dedicated high-spec medical skills laboratories and NHS standard equipment. And you can see on the slide this terrifying thing, which is called the anatomage table. Before I go any further, can anybody tell me what a cadaver is? A body, yeah, a dead body that has been donated to the medical school for medical students to dissect. The traditional way to learn anatomy and to gain some basic experience in practical skills was to use cadaveric dissection. So that's where you dissect the cadaver. It's, a, it's usually a very humbling moment for the students when they do that for the first time, because it really sets into context the reality of what they're working towards. However, tradition doesn't mean good. There is some research that argues that cadavers are not an effective way to teach um, anatomy or surgical skills. And if you think about it, that makes sense to some degree. If you cut into a cadaver, it's nothing like cutting into a live patient during surgery and you gain that experience during your surgical placements anyway. Similarly, for learning anatomy, if you make a mistake on the cadaver, it's gone, okay? So one student makes a mistake on the dissection, you can't really use it again. So instead of cadavers, we utilize virtual dissection tables, which is this anatomage table that I've circled on the, um, on the slide. And this isn't just a simulation. These virtual cadavers are based on real patients. So you can bring up multiple patients, different gender, different ethnicity, different age. You see their body to begin, and you can use a virtual scalpel to peel away layer by layer. You can rotate it and it'll let you see the gross anatomy, the underlying anatomy, the physiology. But the, the benefit of it, of course, is that when you use a virtual dissection, if you make a mistake, you can just press undo, and then it undoes what you did. With the virtual dissection, you can use the same patient record again and again and again. So we try to use these modern uh, style equipment 
when we educate you. And you can see as well from the image on the bottom left, sorry, the bottom right, that's our anatomy suite where we have uh, plastic models. So Mariam has asked, is it simulated to make the body act as if the person is alive? No, so with the anatomage table, it's as if it's a cadaver that you're dissecting. However, we do have other simulations of, shall we say, simulated patients um, using other software. But one of the real benefits, and we'll touch on this as we move on, is the early patient contact, because you'll be seeing patients as early as your first semester of first year. So you don't need simulated patients. You see the real thing. Now, do bear with, I just need to clear my drawings again. Okay, so again, thinking about our state-of-the-art facilities, this is our clinical skill suite, which simulates an NHS lab. So Sarmad, who's a current student from South Africa, has said that the facilities, such as the clinical skills and anatomy labs, the library, the gym, are of course first class. And it's also been argued that there is excellent transport links to other major UK cities, such as London, Edinburgh, Manchester. So if you want to get to Manchester, it's only about an hour away from Preston, London about two and a half hours on the train. So you're quite well connected. And Preston itself can be quite a beautiful campus. So one student has said that one of their favourite places in Preston is Avonham Park, which is a beautiful area close to the city centre for a jog, walk or cycle. And it's a great way to get fresh air after a long day of study. In addition to the Preston campus, we also have campuses in Burnley and Westlakes. We also have campuses in Cyprus, and I keep petitioning to get sent over to Cyprus so I can have a bit of nicer weather in my life. But unfortunately, I keep getting remanded to Preston. But the Burnley campus and the Westlakes campus are relevant for you as, men as medical students because in phase two, which is years three, four, and five, you can go to Burnley and Westlakes, okay? You leave the Preston campus at that point. As I mentioned, we have a variety of undergraduate programs. So we have Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, an MBBS with foundation year, PA studies, medical sciences degrees, and medical science foundation. And we'll, talk, we'll touch on what some of these are as we move through. The, the meat of this presentation though, is about MBBS. Okay, so five year program. Our MBBS degree, like most primary medical qualifications in the UK is five years, okay? If you don't quite meet the entry criteria, we also have a six year program, okay? And that's where the entry criteria is a bit lower and it's a continuous six year degree to lead you to the end point of becoming a doctor. We're accredited by the General Medical Council. We're listed in the World Directory of Medical Schools. And as I mentioned, you have early patient contact and clinical experience in diverse UK settings. We have an innovative curriculum. And again, we'll touch on what that means. And a large number of places available for international students. A ballpark would be between 85, 90% of our students on MBBS are international. And currently we've had 100% graduate placement onto foundation year training. Our previous students have said that um, one of the real things they really loved was that placement in year one. So as I mentioned, you have early patient contact in a university setting um, as early as semester one, but you also do actual placements in year one as well. We have some small group sessions, you have patient interaction, and a huge variety of international diversity. Now, before I go any further, can anybody tell me what the international symbol for medicine is? Perfect, Mariam. It's a snake. What else? What does, what's that snake doing? Fangs are in a cup. I've not seen that one, I have to admit. It's revolving around a line, there you go. Oh, not quite Staph of Hermes, it's the Rod of Asclepius, but you're all on the right line. 
and Hajar has said it's a staff with two snakes wrapped around it. Fun fact, that's actually an international error because two snakes wrapped around it is a business symbol. One snake around a rod is the medicine symbol, but the one with two snakes is actually just an international error that's surprisingly prevalent. I think it's the rod of Cacadias. Anyway, that symbol for medicine, a snake winding around the rod, okay? Can you see that our curriculum is evocative of that? So if I highlight the part that I'm referring to and see here, throughout your five year MBBS degree, you have a central spine of professionalism because the, one of the most fundamental things that you have to do if you want to be a doctor is to be professional, both in your personal and practice life. And around that rod of professionalism, we have our spiral winding curriculum with three themes. So from our um, themes in the curriculum, we have our integrated science and clinical medicine theme, which is over here, and which transitions into medicine in clinical practice as you move to phase two. Our second theme is MSQC, medical skills and quality care. That's where you interact with patients, learn to conduct a physical examination, take a history. We also have EPOM, evidence-informed practice of medicine. And this is where you think about things like the biopsychosocial model of medicine. And that biopsychosocial model of medicine is one of the most important things that you need to get to grips with as a clinician, okay? It used to be that medicine was just disease, drug, done, okay? But in reality, your patients are much more complex than that. They have social needs, they have psychological needs, and all of that will influence patient care. So therefore, to be a holistic practitioner, you need to be able to consider not only biological characteristics, but also social characteristics, psychological things, because all of those are hugely influential on in patient care. Now, I know somebody mentioned this earlier, but can anybody tell me what epigenetics is? And the relevance of this will become clear in a moment. Any ideas, guys? What do you think epigenetics is? How the environment affects genes. Oh, you're, you're quite close, Mariam. You're quite close. Not quite, though. How you behave. Oh, you guys are getting on, along the right lines. So I'll, I'll give it away. The nutshell definition is that an epigenetic change is a modification to the DNA that is reversible. Okay? So if you think about mutation, you're going to think in terms of, oh, my DNA sequence has changed. And that's permanent, okay? Comparatively, epigenetic modifications are alterations to the DNA that are reversible. So it's like chemical tags, for example. Now, it's been shown, if memory serves me, it's been shown through research that the way that you respond to stress as an individual leaves epigenetic tags on your DNA, and that will affect how your grandchildren respond to stress, okay? So pause and think about that for a moment. Your psychology and how you think about things and how you handle things can influence things two generations later. So therefore, isn't it common sense that the patient's psychology will have a significant impact on their own health and prognosis. It's crazy, isn't it, Mariam? So that's why that EPOM is so crucial, okay? You need to think as a holistic practitioner. The other thing it considers in EPOM is what's known as evidence-based medicine. So you'll learn and think about different research designs, how we know what an effective treatment is versus something ineffective. And you'll also learn epidemiology. 
And as I'm sure you're all aware from the past two years, epidemiology is incredibly important because it's about global disease, such as coronavirus. So Khaldun said that behavior and environment both affect the genes. And yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it's, a, it's a relatively junior field, you know, it's still evolving, but the more we learn about it, the more, it, the more amazed we are, quite frankly. So this, that was the EPOM module. And again, the whole point of this spiral curriculum is that you're going to revisit uh, the same content in deeper level and more complexity as you move through your degree. So let's give you an example. In year one, I'm, we, I might teach you guys about how the cell divides. So, you know, you're thinking about your cellular division, basic mitosis and meiosis. And that's how it is in a healthy case, for example. In year two, we'll revisit the cell cycle and I'll say, okay, now that you've um, got a mutation in this gene, this is what leads to cancer because you lose control of the cell cycle. In years three, four, and five, which is more clinical, you'd be like, okay, this patient has cancer. How do we treat it? What do we do? How do we handle it? So that whole element of that spiral curriculum, it really helps to integrate and revalidate the knowledge that you've been gaining across the five years. And this summarizes the, um, the five-year program of MBBS. And again, you can see the themes with your ISCM or MICP in red, evidence-informed practice of medicine or EPOM in blue, and medical skills and quality care in gray. You'll notice that year five is entirely about transition to clinical practice. Okay, and that is because at the moment you take your final university exams at the end of year four. That determines your uh, class ranking and things, which can influence your foundation year applications. And then you move on and year five is all about that transition to clinical practice. So our five year program is learning outcome based and it's been mapped to the General Medical Council's documentation, such as promoting excellence. We have an elective period where you can study abroad, for example, and we have multiple learning and teaching strategies where we try to include small group teaching where possible. And there's also an option for high performing students to take an intercalated degree at master's level at the end of year four. So for example, you can study MBBS for four years, then do one year doing an MRES, like a medical degree, sorry, a medical a science degree by research. So you could work with a research active academic such as me and for a year and potentially get published as a, as a research scientist. So Aya has asked, when we do clinical practice, do we still take on courses or just focus on, okay. So in your phase one, which is years one and two, you're predominantly in university. So in year one, you'll do a two week placement after your summative exams. And in year two, you will spend for 16 weeks, one day a week in clinical practice. In years three, four, and five, if my memory serves, you will be spending one day a week at university, three days a week on placement, and one day a week for self-directed study. Hope that answers your question, Aya. So that intercalation option, if we just if we circle back, that intercalation option is, will allow you to um, gain another degree and more experience as well. As I mentioned, you spend years one and two in the Preston campus. Years three and four, you'll be either in Burnley or Westlakes. And year five, you'll be in Burnley. Westlakes campus is a re relatively remote location, but it's a beautiful campus. I've been there, it's lovely. And it's the home for our National Center for Remote and Rural Medicine and it's based near West Cumberland Hospital. So thinking about the student experience, when you start, you will be given the opportunity to engage in some team building and group work activities. Um, in the past, we used to take students out to Wales and they would go on kayaking and things like that. Uh, but unfortunately with COVID, we've had to adapt, but we'll see how the situation evolves but there will be that opportunity for you to bond with fellow students and bond with staff as well. Uh, 
Dana has asked, is this program for graduate or undergraduate students? So our MBBS degree is a five year degree that you can enter straight from school. Okay, so it's for undergraduate entry. However, we do accept graduate applicants. So if you have a degree, you can apply for the MBBS, but it's still the full five years. It's not a shorter four year program, for example. Now, when it comes to getting towards the end of your degree, you'll want to start thinking about your progression. So we'll give you career related guidance and support on the transition to medical practice. We'll guide you through the NHS Foundation Programme and if you want to practice elsewhere in the world. So for example, some students are very interested in the USMLE, which is the United States Medical Licensing Exam. And they do speak to their tutors in phase two, I believe, to get a bit more advice around that. So obviously, after the past 25 minutes, you're all going to apply for UCLan. So how do you do that? If you're a UK applicant, you'll need to apply via UCAS by the 15th of October to start in the following academic year. For international applicants, you can apply via UCAS or as a direct application. So that means, for example, if you're an international student applying for multiple medical schools, you can use all five of your choices for other universities and then make a direct application with us. But you can submit an application throughout the year. For 2022 entry, your A-level requirement is AAB, but starting from 2023, we're going to increase that to three A's. And that's just in response to um, market demand. For all the A-level requirements, however, you need to have chemistry and at least one other science. If you have an alternative qualification, my colleague, uh, Jill Palmer, can advise on those and the appropriate entry criteria for you. For international students as well, you'll need to show English language proficiency, and that can be done with an IELTS of 7.0 in all components. You apply with a personal statement, a skills statement, and you'll be, conduct you'll be selected to come to interview. And that interview might be by MMI format, which is multiple mini interviews, or it can be a panel interview. And again, this just depends on how things evolve with the COVID-19 pandemic. The other consideration is that when it comes to your entry requirements, we don't require the UCAT, the BMAT, the MCAT or anything, okay? We judge it based only on your record, personal statement, skill statement, okay? And then your performance at interview. As I mentioned earlier, we also have a six year program, which is available if your grades are a bit shy. So the A-level equivalent, for example, would be ABB. And again, that requires you to pass an interview. So when it comes to applying for our MBBS, thinking about the personal statement now, what do you actually know about the role and duties of, the, of a doctor? Can you give us examples of team working? Can you talk about your awards or your extracurricular strengths? And a key role of personal statements is one of the same key roles as creative writing, okay? And that is show, don't tell, okay? Anybody can say, I'm a good team player. I'm very intelligent. I can handle pressure. Anybody can say that. What makes your application strong is if you can show us that you've got those skills. So instead of just saying, I'm good at teamwork, give us an example of when you led a team. Give us an example of when you coped under pressure and how you did that and what strategies you employed. Give us an example of your accomplishments outside of academia. Because if you can show us that you've got a skill rather than telling us, that's more points in your favor. And Aya is exactly right. Actions speak louder than words. Think about your work experience as well. So this doesn't have to be paid and it can be just voluntary experience. And it's ideally something involving care, okay? It doesn't have to be shadowing a doctor because not everybody has that opportunity. But think about what you've done or what you might be able to do and how those skills are transferable to medicine, okay? So for example, let's imagine that you are a um, peer mentor at school. That's not medicine, it's not clinical, but it requires much of the same attributes, effective communication skills, patience, the ability to communicate information. So 
you can tell us and show us that your skills are relevant to medicine, even if your experience and work experience isn't in a clinical context. But one of the key things that's really valuable is the ability to reflect, okay? So when you come on to medicine, we train you to be reflective practitioners. And what that means is that you don't just take things at face value. You don't just think, okay, my day's done, the end. You think about what your experience was, how you responded, how could you have done it better? What would you do differently? As you evolve and as you grow and become more mature and more experienced in the field of medicine, you'll start to reflect naturally. It, doesn't, it won't be a formal process anymore. But if you can show us that you can already reflect on what you're doing, then that's really good for you. Interviews. Our invites to interview are determined on the basis of your personal statement and transferable skills statement and your reference, okay? But if you're invited to interview, it could be in one of two formats. It'll either be, for example, an MMI, which is a multiple mini interview, or a normal panel. So an MMI is what's used by a lot of medical schools these days. <clears throat> and the idea is you go in and there's, for example, eight different stations with eight different assessors. Each assessor will give you a score for their particular scenario. And then the scores are collated and it's the top performing students who are made an offer. The thing with an MMI is it's not about specific knowledge, okay? So I teach biochem and I teach genetics and evidence-based medicine. And I would love to ask you guys in a interview, oh, what's the role of phosphofructokinase one in biochemistry metabolism? And why are case reports a weak level of evidence on the, on the EBM hierarchy? Unfortunately, I can't ask that because that's specific knowledge. The MMI instead is about how do you interpret information? How do you make decisions during ethical dilemmas? Can you communicate? Can you critique? So it's not about specific knowledge. It's how do you approach a problem, okay? As a result of COVID, however, we have paused our MMIs and we're doing panel interviews at the moment, but we still assess the same GMC domains of good medical practice as we do with the MMI. So it's the overall, the overall competency is still the same, it's just a different delivery format. When it comes to practicing medicine in the UK, the, the procedure is that you graduate your medical school and you complete the GMC medical licensing exam or medical licensing assessment. You apply for the NHS foundation training and we support you fully in your application for foundation year because as a graduate of UCLan, you're a UK graduate. And in the UK, the rate of success um, of placement into the foundation program is probably the highest globally. And what I mean by this is that in some countries, they can graduate, let's say 100 doctors, but only 70 of them will match and get a training post. The UK is probably the highest globally for the number of junior doctors that match to the training program. So that's well over 90%. This will be subject to visa requirements, but we do have a visa office in the university who can help advise on these things. So once you've completed your undergraduate medical degree, you do two years of foundation year training where you rotate amongst different specialties. And that's where you're salaried as an employee. And then you undertake your specialty or general practice training. So it'll take approximately three years of training to become a GP and five to seven years or maybe longer for other specialties. And there are about 60 different medical specialties. Some useful links are the Med Schools Council, the GMC website, and of course, our website. And if you have any questions, you can refer to the link on the page, send an email to mbbsadmissions at uclan.ac.uk, or so if we've still got a bit of time, you can type it in the chat. But I've been, it's been a pleasure to speak to you all, and I'd be happy to take any questions in the chat. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Amir. This was very, very interesting. Um, indeed, <laughs> I might even consider a degree in <laughs> Okay. Uh, Jill, is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of um, requirement or uh, anything that you'd like to add, or is that it? 
Thanks, Reem. Yeah, I, I think Emma's covered everything fantastically. I did put a couple of links into the chat. So if any attendees want to just pop back through, scroll, you can take a copy of the URLs. But everything is super easy to find on the website. And you can also just uh, get in touch with you guys at Education Basket uh, for that support with the applications, because I know that you'll do a fantastic job in supporting the students. Thank you, absolutely. Um, so we have one question. Someone is asking, what would you do to combat misinformation within the public health sector? Oh, that is a good question. Um, and it's actually something that's very relevant in today's world with the COVID-19 pandemic. Because I don't know about you, but um, there's all those conspiracy theories that you hear. For example, that it's a, it's a 5G implant. Although to be fair, the reception on my mobile telephone has gotten a lot better since I got my vaccine. So in terms of combating misinformation, a lot of what this can come to is actually public engagement. So one of the things that I do teach on some of the modules I lead is about public engagement and how you can put on events, for example, and educate the public. Because speaking as a scientist, a lot of scientists aren't trained to communicate with the public. So they can be very complicated, it can be quite jargony. So if you train people to communicate effectively, then that alone will break down the barriers. And I think it's about being, in my opinion at least, I think it's about being empathetic as to why they've got that misunderstanding. I think often if you confront someone directly in an aggressive manner about these things, then it can make them defensive and a bit more eager to stick with their existing opinion. Whereas if you approach it from a position of empathy and like, oh, how did you arrive at that opinion? What's your source? Let's have a look. They'll be a bit, they'll be a bit more amenable to change. That said, it's impossible to reason somebody out of an opinion that they didn't reason themselves into. So it depends why they're believing it in the first place. Yeah, definitely that makes sense. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Um, okay, so maybe we have one in Q&A. Okay, so someone is asking how to deal with academic stress and have a good work-life balance. So actually, that's one thing that we did touch on when it comes to the well-being services in the school. So UCLan, we did invest, I think it was the most money in 2020 into student well-being. So there are a number of pastoral and well-being services in the school. One of them is the student coach. So we have a student coach and he can help you with effective study methods because I'm going to make a statement. OK, I know I'm being recorded, but I'm going to make a statement that's probably shall we say, not something a teacher should say. So let's face it, if you're coming on to study medicine, you're smart, okay? It's a fact. You have to be smart to get into medicine. So that means that if you have that intelligence, you can compensate for less than effective studying methods, okay? Whereas when it comes to studying medicine, the pace and the volume of the content is so high that you need to be as effective as possible. So one of the things that we give you is a primer on the most effective evidence-based ways to study, and that will save you significant time. I would say that the majority of students who come onto the course, both medicine and PA, they change how they learn. Quite typically what people will do when they are studying for their A-levels, for example, or their equivalent qualification, is to make notes, you know, they'll write notes and highlight, and that is next to useless as a revision strategy, okay? The best way for some to learn is actually spaced repetition, active recall, and chunking your time. So we actually teach you, okay, these are the most effective evidence-based ways for active recall and for memorization and learning. So you combine those effective methods with the well-being services to give you an ear to talk to. But one of the most important things that you can do for yourself is to give yourself time off. I know that sounds paradoxical, but actually, if you're working all the time, your brain becomes tired, less efficient, and you can't engage with the material as easily. Give yourself a bit of a break, and you'll suddenly find that you are a bit more refreshed and a bit more able to deal with things. So the nutshell answer is effective studying methods, breaks, and not being afraid to ask for help if you need it, okay? Because one of if you... If you can't accept help yourself, how can you give help to your patients? Right, absolutely. Great answer. Okay, I think that is it in terms of uh, questions. 
Uh, okay, a lot of students are asking how they can access this uh, webinar. So it has been recorded and we will post it later on on our website. Um, also, just to remind everyone, you will get a, a certificate for participating. And also when you get it, you can uh, have access to the recording and check everything. And for um, everyone who's attending who is interested in pursuing uh, or applying to the to UCLan University, we will also be in touch with everyone who attended today to check in on them. Uh, just on a final note, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amir and Jill for uh, participating. It was really helpful. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope that you enjoyed. And as a reminder, this is the third webinar of the webinar series that we're having. And the next one would be on uh, March 8th. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, Reem. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.